Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope as you're digesting lunch today, you'll still have time and room to hear a little bit about what I have to share. I have to tell you something. I hope that you take what is presented this afternoon as the start of a discussion. You know, I'm, face, I'm looking at a room full of African educators, African heads of institutions, and don't think that I'm telling you now, here's how to contextualize all of your lessons in your universities. I hope rather that what you hear are some ideas about how to move the process forward while we have this conversation. And the reason why is because this subject is near and dear to me. It's something that I find very personal. The reason being is I remember whenever I first arrived in Africa in February of 1998. I arrived in Nigeria and I was going to be teaching at the Kaduna Baptist Theological Seminary. I was a freshly minted Master of Divinity student who really knew far less than he thought he did. And I started teaching. And I found that what I was doing was just copying what I had seen my professors do whenever I was at Southwestern Seminary. And the truth is, I didn't know anything about education theory. I didn't know anything about pedagogy. I didn't really know anything about contextualization. And really what I was doing was just importing what I knew from an American university setting, an American seminary setting, and trying to bring that to Nigeria and just saying, now you need to learn everything I've just learned and you're gonna understand it exactly the same way I've understood it. And I scratched my head sometimes when it didn't seem like the students did get it. Well, it took about nine years later and I arrived in Francophone Africa this time and I was in Togo and I realized I needed to change something. And so while I was there, I began a process of reading. What do I do to teach differently? And so if you'll pardon me, what I'm about to present to you this afternoon is really an internal dialogue that I've had with myself for about the last eight to 10 years. How do I transform what it is that I wanna to teach to my students in a way that I think they will be able to hear and to process and to understand it. And it's really for the first time that I'm making this information available for other people to hear. So with that in mind, I believe the best thing that I can do for all of you to understand what it is that I've been processing is to hear the story of Kofi, Komi, and Kosi. So you see, there was one morning. Kosi woke up and he kicked his brother. Oh, why do you do that? He said, it's time for us to get up. Grab your ax. We promised the village chief that we were going to be cutting down the wood that was going to build the central village meeting place. Oh, I must grab my ax. Yes, grab your ax, Kofi, and tell Komi to grab his ax as well. Do you have them? Yes. We're great. Yes, but I do not know if they can do the job. It says on here, made in Asia. It is cheap material, but they charge too much for it. He said, it does not matter. We will go and we are going to chop the largest tree that we know out into the forest. And so they walked the long way and it was hot. Even for that early in the morning, it was humid and they arrived at the tree. And it was at that moment that they got their axes ready and they began to try to chop that tree down. And so away they went, sugar boom, sugar boom. Shaka boom, 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 shaka boom. But after a while of chopping like this, Kofi, Komi, and Kosi stopped and they said, Ah, this work, it is too hard. And these axes, they were not made for this type of tree. The wood is too hard, the wood is too dense. These axes were made for Asia trees, not for Africa trees. And they asked themselves, where do we go from here? What is the next process? And it was at that moment they realized what they were doing was not taking them forward. And that experience with Komi, Kofi, and Kosi is where we find ourselves in many African seminaries, many African colleges today. What is the situation? The situation is in many of these schools, theological seminaries and pastor schools in sub-Saharan Africa, they face some very sobering challenges concerning their curriculum and pedagogy. 
What's going on? They've received a Western curriculum and pedagogy. Many times, missionaries have taken a seminary curriculum that they got from the United States at one of their own seminaries, and they've brought it to this institution in Africa and said, there you are, you have a seminary curriculum. But the problem is that Western curriculum and pedagogy do not always fit with the educational needs of the students. And what's more, you'll have students who will receive that education and they'll learn it the best they can and they go back to the churches. And the same way in which they were taught at the university or the same way in which they were taught at the seminary is the same thing that they import to their own congregations. And the congregations will listen to this and they will say, this pastor is mad. He does not even teach us the way we learn ourselves and they don't understand it. And the pastor grows disillusioned. And he says, it's your fault that you're not learning this material. I were here and I learned it. And they said, what did that seminary do to you? And then later the student gives up and says, you know what? I thought I was always called to teach anyway. So he wants to go back and get another degree and become a teacher to school and teach other students the same way he was taught. And it perpetuates the problem. Tell me, is that not true? Do you not find this experience in many of your places? Yes, sir. So then, the schools, they look at this and they realize, gee, we might need to do something, but they're afraid. They're afraid they're going to risk losing their own credibility, not only with other schools, but with the churches if they change the existing curriculum that they have. So then, where do we go from here? Why is it that these Western educational models don't fit in Africa? Well, David Hesselgrave gives us some insight on that. He quotes from an anthropologist by the name of E.M. Smith, and he says there's more than one way in which people think. There's more than one fashion. And I want you to hear me say this. No one way of thinking is superior to another because every culture incorporates all three, but one of them is in the priority sector within one given culture. So for example, you'll have the conceptual model. That involves deductive logic, inductive logic, and it's more reasoning or cognition by postulation. And that is what is more common you'll find in Western societies, Western cultures. There's also the psychical way of thinking. What is that? That is cognition or thinking that occurs by way of intuition. People will take general bits of data and then they'll come down to a conclusion by way of their intuition. But Ian Smith noted a third way of thinking, and that's called the concrete relational. And this one identifies more closely with African cultures in general and sometimes with Asian civilizations. What is it about concrete relational? Concrete relational way of thinking looks at life and reality that are seen pictorially in terms of active emotional relationships present in a concrete situation. They think concretely. There's an emotional bond in the relationships and they see everything as a picture. That's the concrete way of thinking, the concrete relational way of thinking. So then what's the summary of the challenges to traditional theological education in Africa? The traditional educational model that has been received in Africa follows more of a system that is imported from Europe and the United States, and that system favors a conceptual intellectual framework. Unfortunately, these institutions that favor a conceptual model are operating in a continent that is predominantly concrete relational in its cognitive orientation. And so then this clash of intellectual frameworks is what's responsible for the cognitive dissonance that we see. And then this creates another problem. The challenge of traditional theological education is in developing a curriculum and a pedagogy that are simultaneously localized and yet at the same time are globalized so that the students are equipped to talk and discuss and have a theological discussion or conversation with the outside world. And so it's this odd balancing act, how to be localized and globalized simultaneously. So then, there are some people who have made some suggestions how we move forward. Some say, let's just continue 
with the educational curriculum and pedagogy that we've already received. Sometimes you'll see African institutions. They're afraid we'll lose accreditation or we'll lose credibility if we do anything to change the existing curriculum that we have. The problem with that, they may be globalized, but I don't think they're sufficiently localized. Then you've got others, including some missionaries who say, the real thing is, the American university system or the European university system is not an African system. So the real way to move forward and to train and equip African pastors is just to get rid of the theological institutions. Move out, get rid of the libraries, get rid of the books, tell people stories. And by hearing stories, that's the way that they're going to be trained because that's the African way of learning. I think that way of thinking is equally erroneous. And the reason being is, it's localized all right, but it's not sufficiently globalized. There is another way forward. So then, formal theological institutions must engage their students in a manner that engages their own cognitive framework in order to promote learning and lasting impact for their local ministries, but at the same time, African theological institutions must prepare leaders who are equipped to engage with issues of concern on the world stage. What will African leaders do if they have not been equipped to speak with African theological, or excuse me, with Asian theological leaders, with European theological leaders, with American theological leaders? Do they just say we tell stories under a baobab tree? I don't think that's going to work. So then, they have to have the knowledge, the skills, and the capacities to interact with global leaders worldwide. But we do have to contextualize. Where do we go? What do we do? As a newly appointed missionary, I looked for resources because people had approached me when they knew I was going into theological education in Africa. And while I was still in the United States, they said, don't you think we need to keep the main thing the main thing, Trevor? Don't you think we should just go to stories? And I told them, I think there's a better way, but I need to find it. And I found the solution from an African scholar. She is a Navarian. Her name is Undri Tiasie Lumumba. She's a professor at Cornell University in New York. Not only that, but she also directs a research center at the University of Abidjan. And in this article, Higher Education in Africa, Crises, Reforms, and Transformation, what she offered as a solution was the idea of fusion. And I'll just read what Asie Lumumba writes. To manage and make the best use of old and new external relations, some have proposed that the idea of fusion as one way to take stock of Africa's reservoirs of knowledge and frames of reference. The notion of fusion proposes a deliberate choice by Africa to appropriate some elements of their received institutions, values, and ways of doing things. These chosen elements can be added to, mixed, and fused with African institutional, cultural, and other realities to create an enriched original system. Part of the argument is that even though Africa did not initiate the coming of the Europeans and the transfer of the institutions to Africa, to make it work, Africans must appropriate this inheritance and make use of what it considers the most relevant for itself while it is firmly grounded in its culture in order to have a sense of direction. Hence, fusion would be the way forward. We take some of the existing European cultures that Africa has inherited, and at the same time, we propose a fusion of African elements so that what we have is something that is distinctly African. So says Asie Lumumba. But now here's the question. What would fusion look like in an African theological educational curriculum? You see, Kofi, Kosi, and Komi they were looking at that tree with that ax. And Kofi, he finally dropped his ax and he says, this is not working. We need to do something else. But then Kosi said, what would you propose? And Komi said, maybe we should just go to the tools that were used by our ancestors. But Komi said, that would take too long. We would have to go back to our village. We would have to search for the materials to make it. And I do not know if those tools would be sufficient to cut a tree this large. But he says, but this ax that we were sold that was made in Asia, 
is not made of the material to cut down a tree of this size. So what do we do? And it was that time that Kofi, that Kosi had an idea. <coughs> and he said to his brothers, do you know why I invited you to help me cut down this tree? And they said, no, why? He said, there's an African proverb that says it takes more than one ax to cut down a tree. He said, well, yes, we're here and we're helping you, but it's not working. He said, what if we take that proverb a step further? What if not only does it take the axes that we have brought to the tree, but we consider those who have made the axes that we are using and they are helping us, but not even they are enough. Maybe we have to swing the ax that was made in Asia the way our African ancestors taught us, and maybe that will give us the rhythm and the strength that we need to cut down the tree. And Komi and Kofi thought about what Kosi just said, and they said, let's engage in that right now. And that's why I ask you again, what would fusion look like in an African theological institution curriculum? I propose to you that I believe orality is the way forward. Now, I say that word orality with fear and trembling because I'm in a room full of people who work in traditional theological educational institutions. And my concern is for many of you, orality might be a dirty word. You may think, can we really involve orality? And what I would say to you is, it depends on what you mean by orality. And to help you understand that, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a history of orality, and I'm going to tell you that there's more than one vision of how we look at orality. And allow me to say something else. Perhaps we need to look at orality differently than the ways that we have looked at it before. And knowing that, we might be able to move forward and incorporate orality, yes, even in, tr in a traditional theological educational setting. So yes, we can do that, and orality does not mean get rid of the library. Orality would not mean get out of the classroom. Orality does not mean just tell stories. Orality can mean so much more. But to understand that, let's just say, what is orality? Orality was the study of how the dominant sense used in information exchange impacts the cognitive faculties and the culture of human societies. They began by accident during some literary research that was done by Milman Perry and Albert Lord. They went on to Serbia and Croatia and they continued this process. And then they developed something that became known as the oral formulaic theory. There was another individual who came along by the name of Eric Havelock. And he decided to do some more studies and he looked at Greek culture and Greek civilization in ancient times. And Havelock said it was the invention of the alphabet with vowels that allowed Greek culture and Greek society to continue. So that perpetuated some of these ideas about orality. But again, they were still just beginning. And then Walter Ong came along, and he wrote the book, Orality and Literacy, The Technologizing of the Word. Of the Word. And it was Ong that argued that writing is a technology that shifts language from an oral to a visual medium, and this shift affects the way that a culture thinks, the way that a culture processes information, how it perceives reality, and how it develops as a culture, and how it processes information. But Ong is not the last word, even though many people quote from him. There are many other voices about orality that are out there. How did Christian scholarship begin to engage orality? Before some of the first practitioners began using orality, there were Old Testament studies done using the principles of orality. I won't tell you each of these books. Some of the most notable was by Susan Knight. It's Oral World and the Written Word, Ancient Israelite Literature. And over in New Testament studies, the one that I like the best because of his evangelical conclusions is Richard Baucom, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, the Gospel is Eyewitness Testimony. But how did practitioners, how did practitioners of orality begin using it? At first, there was Trevor McElwain of New Tribes Mission. No relation, anyone. But what did Trevor McElwain say? He sought to develop a method of evangelism and discipleship that would curb the syncretism that was going on in Brazil and Colombia among New Tribes ministries. In addition to that, McElwain used biblical theology and developed a narrative approach to evangelism and discipleship. And his approach was called the Chronological Bible Teaching Method. 
Not only that, you know, that was back in 1981. But then there was also Mark and Gloria Zook of New Tribes Mission. And whenever they took this chronological Bible teaching to the MOOC people in West uh, New Britain, they witnessed mass conversions during the presentation of the stories of the gospel. You can look at their vid a video of what they did. It's called Itau, which means it is true in the traditional language of the people that they sought to evangelize. But then the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention began using it. And some of the pioneers of that were Avery Willis and Jim Slack. And today, the director of Orality uh, Ministries is Grant Lovejoy. And I believe we should recognize the contributions that these men have made to the practice of ministry and orality and what has taken place. But I think it's necessary for us to consider the future of orality and ministry practice. Because you see, some people have taken orality and I remember hearing one person say, there was an African lady who said, literacy is a shroud that we wear around our shoulders, but orality is who we are. Essentially saying, why do we really need any kind of written material? We should just do all teaching using oral methods. I, I just want to ask a show of hands. How many of you have heard a type of orality that is like that? Is that what you have heard in your own context? Curious. I see a lot of people nodding. Okay. Well, what I want to present to you is that's a version of orality that represents just one school of thought when it comes to orality research. There's more to the story. In applied linguistics, I'm referring to the International Encyclopedia for Linguistics. They identify two competing interpretations of orality and how the medium of language affects human cognitive function. The version that you've heard probably in all of the studies about orality, orality that have been given, particularly if they're dependent upon the writings of Walter Ong, is what's called the unilinear evolutionary view. I know that's a mouthful, just know that it's, just think it moves in a straight line. Orality moves in a straight line. And what these people will say is, of course, it's not as simple as just oral people and literate people. They'll say orality moves in a progression. It's a single straight line. You'll go from primary oral culture to oral preference people. Then you go to the literate side and you'll have a manuscript culture where people will write things down by hand. Then you get to a typographic culture where everybody prints things out. And then you get to a hypertext culture where we have computers and texting and email and what have you. The thing about that view is no matter which culture, no matter which society, which continent we're talking about, it's that same linear progression. It just depends on where people are on that continuum. There's a competing view, the contextual ideological view. And what they say is this, morality is more dynamic than that. People do not follow that same linear progression in any society because this view, the first one, does not take sociology seriously enough. So what will happen is this, how writing and orality will interact with each other will look very different in one part of the world as compared to another part of the world. So to say like Walter Ong that there's this linear progression and all societies follow that is frankly rather naive. Orality is more complex. In fact, it is a mistake to say that orality should be written orality with a big capital O because the truth of the matter is it's not one big orality with a big capital O, it's multiple oralities, plural, with a lowercase o. Because there is no one version of orality. Orality looks different in one place as opposed to another. And how orality is impacted in one society looks very different from the way it is engaged in another society. And so it's a mistake to have a bundle of stories and say everybody everywhere should share the same stories and that's how we're going to arrive at education because orality is much more complex than that. So the, at the other thing that should be borne in mind, the philosophy undergirding both of these was following a type of continental European philosophy. Both of them, continental philosophy, the first one was structuralist assumptions, and the second one, post-structuralist, just think deconstruction when I say post-structuralist. The structuralists, Walter Ong, if you've heard of him, I just referred to him. He was reliant upon the writings of Claude Levi Strauss, 
who was a French anthropologist. He was also the father of structuralist apologetics. And why? He followed the same view of language, structuralism. It was highly subjective, and it dealt with binary opposites. Because in that view of language, which was borrowed from um, uh, Ferdinand, Paul Ferdinand Strauss, he said that this version of language, you looked at one sign, and the way to differentiate that sign from other signs was basically to compare it. And if it didn't agree with that sign, you knew what this one meant. It was not like a sign and referent. This sign refers to this object. It was the interplay of one sign to another sign. The problem with that was it made language very subjective. It made everything dependent upon the interpreter rather than the external world. Deconstruction or post-structuralist thought went even further. It's the reader who determines. But what happened was you had two very different versions of orality, two very different conclusions. And I'm not going to read all of these because we don't have enough time. But I was going to say this is some of the thought. The part that you need to understand about the unilinear view is they said this is what the way it will characterize all oral cultures at all times. It's just a matter of which stage on the continuum they happen to be. This view, it's got problems as well because this view of language is still highly, highly subjective. But they made two correctives of the unilinear view that I think we need to bear in mind. One of them, they noted the interrelatedness of orality and literacy. We would not know what orality was if we were not a literate society, because then we could compare it with literacy. But at the same time, orality and literacy are highly dependent upon each other. And there are different stages of dependence depending on which society that we go. The other thing that they said that I agreed with is that it had a local rather than a universal understanding of orality and literacy, meaning the way that orality manifests in one culture will be very different from a different culture. Now, I accepted those conclusions from the contextual view. Why? Not because I agreed with their philosophy, but because of the empirical research that had been done that was used to support this particular view. So, for example, there is a journal. It's not a Christian journal at all, but it's a journal of orality. It's called the Journal of Orality Studies. And they noted research that was done in Ghana. And to show the complex interrelationship between writing and literacy, someone researched Ghanaian contemporary storytellers. Would you like to know how current people writing, uh, developing stories for today in Ghana compose their stories? These are oral storytellers. They write them down. Okay, you heard what I just said. So-called oral preference people and they're getting ready to prepare stories that they're going to deliver orally. And what do they do to compose these stories that they're going to develop, that they're going to deliver orally? They write them down. You see, orality and literacy are very complex. And just to say, oh, we're going to do everything oral because that's the way they do it, that's not the way the Ghanaians do it. And also in Liberia, to show the complexity that is going on between the, the interdependence between orality and literacy, other researchers looked at the Vi people of Liberia, and there is a linguistic phenomenon that is called deglossia. That means two languages or two tongues, literally. And it showed that cultures that exhibit deglossia or two languages or more show a level of interaction with that language that differs depending on what that language is. So, for example, with the Vi people, they speak three languages. And with their traditional language, it's always spoken. But whenever they speak Arabic, it's always written and read aloud. And with English, it's a combination of both. So where does that unilinear view fit in with the Vi people when on one hand, they're always speaking in one language, when they're always reading in another language, and in a third language, they're reading and speaking? Orality is more complex than what Alter Ong has taught us. And unfortunately, the models that we have created as a missionary agency, have followed the research of Walter Ong. What I'm trying to tell you is this. We as a missionary agency many times have propounded to you, our African brothers, a vision of orality that is based on research that's about 30 years out of date. It's obsolete. And there needs to be a way forward. Is there a way forward in the orality debate? Both schools of thought 
rely upon different streams of continental philosophy, either structuralist or post-structuralist hermeneutics. What I want to suggest to you is there's another type of philosophy that can view the way we use language, and it's not coming from these two streams of continental thinking. It comes from the analytic school. It's called speech act theory. I don't have the time to go into the complexities of speech act theory with you today. I will just posit to you, I think speech act theory gives us the way forward. Why? Many speech act theory proponents recognize hermeneutical realism. What does that mean? We can trust the intent of the author and that we can determine what the intent of the author actually was. Continental thought does not give us that luxury. Continental thought says otherwise. It says it is the reader of the text it is the hearer of the spoken word that determines the meaning. Speech act theory can give us the way forward. Also, speech act theory proponents would accept the contextual ideological argument that orality should be considered local rather than universal. Again, there are complex reasons for that. If you want to hear about them, I can talk to you after this is over. Again, speech act theory could be used in such a way as to acknowledge the complex interdependence between orality and literacy. And just like what we see in Ghana, where there's a complex interchange between the spoken word and the written word, what does that mean for us in African theological institutions? We can use our libraries, we can use our classrooms, and at the same time, we can use orality in our pedagogy. And we can mix and mingle the two at various levels to suit the needs of our students. To that extent then, orality can be a tool that we use to improve our pedagogy in African theological institutions. And this interdependence between orality and literacy reveals how we can implement orality-based educational interventions for a dynamic, I use that word, fusion of African Western pedagogy and a future contextualized curriculum. So then, Kofi, Komi, and Kosi, we're looking at that tree. And Kosi said, I think I have it. And he took the ax and he began moving in the rhythm of his ancestors. He said, what was that proverb that they said to us? Yes, it takes more than one ax to cut down a tree. And he said, we're using the axes of our ancestors because we're following the way that they taught us how to chop down a tree. We're using a rhythm that we did not learn when we used these axes that were made in Asia, but we're using their own axes and we're fusing that with the way that we learned to chop down a tree and together we're going to cut that tree down. Indeed, it takes more than one ax to cut down a tree. So what will that look like when we try to cut down that tree in African theological institutions. The following are examples of things that I did while, I was on the, while I'm on the field in Togo, West Africa. This is roughly between 2010 and 2018. First of all, narrative. You've heard this mentioned before. What's going on with narrative? Pardon me, if you will, but I will try to diagram and chart why is it that narrative works? What is it about narrative? And so I looked at a cognitive developmental theory to try to chart how is it that narrative is effective. This may not be the final answer, but I looked at social constructivism. Now, constructivism was first developed by Piaget, and he said that people develop at various levels of cognitive development. You know, you start with sensory motor, that's little babies. And that's where they use their senses, and they're just barely moving their arms and their legs. Then you go to pre-operational. That's when they're not yet ready to process cognitively, but they're still operating. Then you go to concrete operations. That's when you can have people, they can learn, they can memorize, they can apply. But then you can finally arrive at formal operations. And that's where you can go to higher mental functions. But it took Lev Vygotsky, who criticized some of what Piaget was saying, and he said, learning does not occur with just one single individual. Learning occurs in groups, in social units. And so you can take a single learner, and here's what he can do unaided. But then you have him learn within a group. And with the teacher helping them, this is what's called the zone of proximal development. This means the region where people can learn with the assistance of other people. And you can have a student 
Many adults never arrive at formal operations, which is higher cognitive function. We're talking about analysis and evaluation. We're talking about hypothesis, which is called contrafactual reasoning. You can also talk about problem solving or advanced problem solving. And what, what Vygotsky said was, we can move people further up. It just means pushing them beyond what they can do unaided and with the help of a learning group, they can move her further up the scale. Narrative can help us do that. I cannot tell you how many times I would ask questions when I was in Kaduna that involved an abstract proposition. And as I would present it to the class, that sometimes happens with me today in Togo. And we'll be in a systematic theology class. And I'll ask a question, it's very abstract. And I watch my students, and it just goes right over their heads. And why is that? If we follow social constructivist thought, it's because they're operating in concrete relations, concrete operations, and because they're concrete relational thinkers, that abstract thought is difficult for them to engage. Hear me, I didn't say that they were stupid, and I didn't say they were incompetent. I just said their mental processes work differently, and so by giving them abstract propositions, it's not working. So what do we do? We use a medium that helps the students to engage complex ideas in a way that they can engage with them and arrive at complex thought. Narrative is the medium by which we can do that. Why is that? Narrative can be used by the educator to assist the students as a social unit to understand a complex problem that they could not unaided. In so doing, they move along the continuum from concrete operations, memorization and application, and so doing, they move to formal operations where they do analysis, synthesis, evaluation, creativity, that's where we get to hypothetical reasoning, and they do so through the medium of narrative. Why? because it's the concrete elements of the story that represent abstract uh, concepts and realities. The students move beyond application to the levels of comprehension and formal operations such as analysis, synthesis, evaluation, and creativity. The medium of a narrative helps the student move forward. But we can do more. I tell stories all the time in the classroom and I have found one of the most effective ways that I can teach systematic theology to my students is by telling stories and they begin to engage with it concretely. But there's another thing to do. What do you do with abstract propositions? That's where Proverbs can help us. See, in Western thought, we're used to giving a logical proposition. You know, I remember reading on the door of somebody's dorm room this following logical syllogism. Now, please don't take me seriously, but the logical uh, syllogism ran, God is love, love is blind, Ray Charles is blind, therefore God must be Ray Charles. So that's a bad example of logical reasoning, but that's the example of how Westerners think, abstract propositions, formal operations. If I gave abstract propositions to my students in systematic theology, they would have a difficult time engaging with that. Why? Because they're coming from a concrete relational background. That doesn't mean they're stupid, it just means that they think differently. They think concretely. And there are advantages to concrete relational thought. I don't want you to hear me say that this is somehow primitive or it's somehow less developed. That's why Africans are more relational with people, more relational with a lot of people. And don't think abstract reasoning is the summit of human thinking. One wag once quipped about abstract thought. The problem with abstract thinker, abstract thinking is it moves the abstract thinker further away from the very reality that he seeks to define. So that's it, as far as abstract thought. All the different levels of thinking that we talked about, from conceptual to psychical to concrete relational, they have their strengths, they have their weaknesses. But what do we do with learning challenges? By the time students arrive at the seminary, or they arrive at the African university, higher education demands critical thinking, critical thinking skills. <coughs> that represents formal operations that I just mentioned earlier. That also mentions the stage of cognition, which is along the levels of analysis, synthesis, evaluation, creativity, and Bloom's new taxonomies of learning domains. And abstract thought, again, formal operations, requires reflection in hypothetical possibilities. It's called contrafactual reason. And this conceptual cognition is better suited to this type of thought. But we find African students who struggle with that. And so 
Concrete relational cognition does not reflect in abstract propositions. Rather, it requires concrete expressions of the abstract propositions for the subject in question. So what do we do? We use African proverbs. Remember the story about Komi, Kofi, and Kosi? How was the way that they engaged the problem of chopping down the tree? They took the proverb, it takes more than one ax to cut down a tree, and they used that in a creative way to engage the problem that they were facing. I cannot tell you how many times when I've been teaching in systematic theology classes that I will use a proverb, an African proverb, as a way for the student to engage the abstract proposition. I cannot tell you the times that I have looked at a complex issue when I have been preaching expositionally behind the pulpit and I have used an African proverb to explain the difficult concept. Not only did the congregation enjoy it, but the congregation also understood better than what they would have otherwise if I just tried to preach like a normal Western preacher. One time I tried to explain the concept to people. The concept by Martin Luther, similus de set peccator, meaning simultaneously just and sinful. Well, that's a rather abstract proposition. So what did I teach them? I gave them the African proverb, the Eve proverb, actually. The crab always walks sideways, but it always finds its way home. What does that mean exactly? Well, the whole thought behind that proverb is, is even though the crab appears to be impeded by its manner of movement, you know, it's walking sideways, it always arrives at its intended destination. So I said, imagine that now about the sinner. He's been saved by Jesus Christ, but he's still impeded like, by sin. Like the crab, he's walking sideways. But guess what? He always finds his way home. He gets to heaven because he is a believer and he's making his way. When I use that concept, using an African proverb, the students are engaged. They're thinking critically, but not by using abstract propositions, but rather by using the concrete expression of the African proverb to think critically. Africans can think critically. We just have to employ a different pedagogy to help them to get there. Finally, there's role playing. One of the things I tried to do as I was giving this lesson today is using role play, acting out Kofi, Komi, and Kosi. Well, one of the common arguments that I hear from many people who criticize formal theological education is they note how it has to engage three dimensions in formative development. Cognition, you know, our previous speaker said head, heart, and hands. You know, cognitive, spiritual, and practical. Well, intrinsically, you can't drop a church in the middle of a seminary. So, the practical instruction faces a bit of a challenge. So what do we do? We use role play. Students can act out scenarios in order to engage a complex ministry problem. I do this in my great religions and cults class that I teach in Togo. What do I do? I arrive to class for each lesson and I'm dressed up by that practitioner of that particular religion or that particular cult. Now this makes for some very interesting engagement with the personnel in the seminary because I remember the time I had to teach a lesson in Hinduism. And so I walked out of my house and I'm dressed up like a Hindu Swami. I have a red dot in the center of my head. I'm wearing just this bare orange robe and I'm walking barefoot. And I remember watching the seminary personnel watch me as I'm walking outside, the, walking outside my house on my way to the classroom barefoot and I saw all of them drop whatever it was they were doing and just watch me. And I know they were thinking, what in the world is this crazy white man doing? And then I arrived at the class and then I would engage at three different levels all the time enacting the role of the Hindu Swami. First, I would just give a brief introduction, a little bit of history about Hinduism as a religion. Then I would go into an engagement with the class about the Hindu beliefs and how they would compare with Christian beliefs. And I'd say, if you don't agree with me and what I'm saying, tell me why. But then at the final level, I would invite a student forward and the student would engage with me. But you see, it was more than just information transfer. I took on the personality, I took on the demeanor of a Hindu Swami. And if the student was too aggressive, I would back away and become more passive. And the student would have to learn not just simply to memorize all the facts about Hinduism, he had to learn how do I engage a Hindu. I did the same thing as a Jehovah's Witness. 
We know what Jehovah's Witnesses are like. They just try to talk real fast and just inundate you with all kinds of facts and information and scripture verses and hope they can just bulldoze you right over. So whenever students would engage me, I would just talk rapidly and they'd have to learn to make me shut up just long enough for them to present the gospel to me. And I told the students, it's more than just memorizing facts. You got to learn how to engage. And role play was the way for them to get there because they had to learn not only to use the facts and the information, but they had to learn how to engage. So role play is just a third way that we can use principles of morality for effective pedagogy. So where do we go from here? If this is what we do, using morality as a means to improve our pedagogy in African theological institutions, what should we go, where should we go in the future? Where should this take us? First of all, we need a majority world educational philosophy. We need a majority world educational psychology. And finally, we need a majority world learning theory. Now, I used uh, social constructivism. That view in and of itself has some problems. I don't have the time to go into all the issues, but it's not the one that I would recommend for all times and all places everywhere and say, that's it, that's what we should use. But it helped me at this present stage. But I know there's a way forward. Unfortunately, there is not much work being done for the majority world. Some of the few authors that I have read that have made contributions, unfortunately, do not follow Christian presuppositions or Christian values. For example, one of the best known books that is written about good pedagogy for the majority world is by Paulo Freire, and it's his Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Unfortunately, it follows Marxist assumptions. So I don't think Paulo Freire is the way forward for us. But we need to do something. And I believe orality can at least inform where we go for an educational philosophy, where we go for an educational psychology, where we go for an educational learning theory. Maybe here's the point where we begin to discuss some of that together. Not only that, here's another place where I believe we need to go as people. Mixed methods field work in an orality-based educational intervention. What does that mean? I'm proposing that we develop some classes or teach some classes, maybe in multi-site, maybe meaning more than one place. And it would be a longitudinal study, meaning this wouldn't just be for a few weeks, this wouldn't be for a month. We would do this over the span maybe of three years. And during that time, we'd use both uh, quantitative and qualitative research. Quantitative meaning we would do things like statistics. Qualitative, we'd do things like ethnography, but there are more than one type of qualitative research. There's what's called discourse analysis focus groups, participatory action research. Those are all different types of qualitative field work. And we could do this as a way that would be beneficial as a means of field testing, orality-based educational interventions or educational uh, pedagogy. And the discourse analysis of the student responses as we continue this study could reveal the level of impact that our orality-based pedagogy has made to the student's plausibility structures. What does that mean? Plausibility structures is just a highfalutin sociological term that means their mental categories, how they process information, their worldview. Paul Hebert talks about it in the implicit level of culture. You see, Kevin Rogers asked me two days ago if I'd ever read Paul Hebert. Little did he know I had Paul Hebert mentioned in my presentation. So, Kevin, it's back at you, bro. <laughs> so, that is a proposal because you know what? It's one thing just to talk about it. It's one thing just to dream this stuff up. This is something that I've been thinking about for the last eight to 10 years. We need field work to back it up. We need field work that could show we have proven that this has made an impact in our society, on African culture. This has made an impact on our students. And we believe that while this may not be the last word, we think this is a way forward. And that's what I'm proposing for you. Maybe some of you could help with this kind of research. Maybe you could be active participants in it. So then, producing a working African pedagogy and contextualized educational curriculum has many challenges. Do not think that what I am proposing to you today is the final word. I think it just may be one of many remarks on a very difficult subject. And even if you have not agreed with everything that I have presented today, I hope that it has stimulated thought. I hope that it has stimulated discussion. And I hope that you can take at least some of the ideas that I have pre presented and say to yourselves, 
This is one way that we can improve the pedagogy at our own particular institution. If we have accomplished that much, praise God, I believe that we have moved a step forward. Because as Kofi, Comey, and Kosi have done, they kept chopping at that tree. Shikaboom, 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 shikaboom. Following the rhythm of their ancestors, but using that, those axes made in Asia. And you know what happened? They chopped that tree down. My African brothers, my fellow missionary colleagues, let's chop that tree down.